Expo, owning with her husband a rare breed animal farm in Lincolnville, currently where Ararat Farms is located. So, uh, and Robin has to leave at 10 minutes to one hour time. She's in Texas, so it's an hour earlier, but for a prior commitment. So we're gonna let her start right away. If you have questions, we'll take them afterwards, depending on how much time we have. And uh, Sue Kennard will be watching for questions in the chat for those who are on Zoom. So welcome, Robin. Hi, all. Can you see me or you can only see my slide? We can see you. Oh, you can see me. Okay, I can't hide. Anyway, okay. Well, this is great. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today, especially thanks to both Corliss and Susan, who have been just absolutely amazing in organizing, I'm sure, the whole series, but in particular, um, my participation in it. They've just been absolutely first class. So thank you to both Susan and um, Corliss. Um, you heard a brief introduction of, of who I am, um, and I'm going to um, tell you a little bit more about my background as we proceed. Um, but uh, currently, as you know, I'm a professor um, at the University of um, Austin and the a director of the UT Nutrition Institute, which the, everyone calls here UT and I. So I guess everyone was supposed to know that on campus, but that's basically a nutrition institute. It's been around for a while. But mostly what I'm going to talk to you about today comes from my research uh, from a book that I wrote in 2019 called Food Roots Growing Bananas in I Iceland and Other Tales from the Logistics of Eating. So that will be sort of the foundation for my comments today. So I wrote the book from uh, the perspective of um, a historian, because my scholarship is really as a historian, not, as you might think, as a nutritionist. So I really can't tell you much about what to eat, but I can tell you about why we've been eating it for a long time. So it's really a history of food systems. And mostly I've been studying how cities feed themselves throughout time. That would include food supply chains, for example, but basically systems in general. I studied London's live meat market located in the center of London, one of the first food markets removed from a city. It was removed to a suburb outside London, about, I, guess I would say three miles outside of the center of London, a place called Islington. It was removed in the mid 19th century. And at the time, it was, a, it was a very important moment for cities in general. They were modernizing as a result of a whole range of new technologies from railroads to steam to iron, public health issues. And uh, the departure of rural populations to cities uh, for work in factories. So a lot of the farmers and the producers of food were, were coming into the city. This all changed the urban landscape and made it less hospitable for food markets, especially live meat markets that were surrounded by butchers. So uh, imagine that you're a 19th century Victorian and there's blood in the gutters and a cholera raging in the city and uh, dense accumulations of people in the same spot. So there was quite a concern about removing that from the city. In contrast, to our current interest in moving food markets back into cities. So the presence of food in cities is still being contested. And in some cases, we're moving food back into cities. Although I would, I would um, suggest it's still an experiment. We aren't moving all of our food production back into cities for some pretty obvious reasons. So, how did I get to this topic um, and why am I super excited about, of all things, food supply chains? So here is uh, basically uh, my story um, about how I got here. Um, it um, Basically, the first introduction I had to food um, in any sort of mindful way was during um, high school or the first year of college when my grandmother offered me uh, the chance to go uh, on a language program actually to a small village in the Jura Mountains right outside of Lausanne. 
So I live for a summer only speaking French, which by the way, is a great way to learn a language. And um, day-to-day life on a small farm, very connected to milking cows, making butter from it, um, baking bread, working in the fields, taking our our, um, milk to the local town co-op, and generally getting very, very close to to the source of food and what it was like to, to grow it on a small farm. Then many years later in college, um, I was at the University of Michigan on the first Earth Day and became uh, conscious, I guess, at that point of the fact that that we had limited supplies, that we needed to be more mindful about um, our planet, what was going on. And um, but it was pretty bleak at that point. That was when the ozone um, basically was causing issues. And so everyone was trying to be concerned about the ozone layer and what they could do about it. Um, actually, we did do something about it and that situation was somewhat cleared up. But at the time, it seemed like a, a pretty um, futile task for a young college student about what to do on an individual basis. Well, many, la- many years later, um, uh, married to children, um, and we had an opportunity to move as a family to England for um, a short time. And as I wandered around the countryside with these two kids in England, we came across these historical manor houses, which had an, in the backyard a farm, a usual work- working farm. And in the working farm were usually what they, what the British would call rare breeds, which we now call heritage breeds, really. And it seemed to be, they really focused on this idea that if you brought these breeds back, uh, that would increase the agricultural biodiversity in our system. And it seemed, what was impressive to me was that this, you could do something about this in your own lifetime and you didn't need a whole lot of money. I mean, people that were doing it in England, small, you know, uh, family farms that were just taking on the task of raising these disappearing breeds. So there was much more hope involved in taking taking action about this particular um, conservation activity. So um, I just thought that would be a way to sort of act on all of those concerns that were raised in that first Earth Day. So we returned to the to the um, U.S. And we had been summering in Maine, and uh, while although we were living in California, it seems much it seemed much more um, to our own scale to explore taking on a project of uh, creating a farm, pretty much um, in line with those farms that we saw in England, minus the manor house, by the way, but just focusing on uh, raising these rare breeds. So we did that in Maine for ten years, and. One of the things that I learned out of that experience was as you produced, you know, what you're take, taking your farm produce and uh, trying to sell it, raised all kinds of uh, real uh, hurdles for a small farmer, some of which has to do with processing meat in this case, because we were selling meat and get, and also just selling it to, to people who Uh, didn't want to pay the higher prices that we charged because we were at such small scale um, and really wanted consistent supply at a reasonable price, which uh, one of our local um, restaurants um, at the time preferred, for example, to buy their lamb from New Zealand for perfectly rational. um, They were being perfectly rational about it because that they could get lamb all year long at a good price consistently. Whereas, you know, we were one season, high price, pretty inconsistent. So you began to see what the trade-offs were, what the hurdles were for doing small scale farming uh, in an area that was unique. Uh, At the time we were offering educational programs to students and schools in in the local area there. And it was pretty clear to me after a certain point in time that, that there really wasn't much written about or studied in this area of agricultural history. More or less, how did we get here with these breeds that were uh, rapidly disappearing? 
So I went back to school um, and went to um, uh, Boston University at the time. I mean, I got a, a master's and a PhD in food history. Um, and that's where I really got excited about uh, the logistics, the food supply chain, how food travels around the city and how cities are formed by their food system. Uh, so th that's basically my, uh, my route to today's talk um, and really following that both historically, but also what we're doing today. So speaking of which, looking at something really simple and trying to uh, understand how that simple item got from a producer to a consumer uh, might seem the way to begin, meaning like, how complicated can this be? So for you in Maine, it would begin with a lobster roll. And maybe we can, we can take that as an example of, of uh, sort of unpacking what this food system is. So I don't know, you've probably heard this question a lot recently because it's being asked a lot. Like, do you know where your food's coming from? Uh, this seems to be like the prevailing question both uh, amongst us and in the media. And um, by the way, there's a really funny episode. If, if any of you want to look at past the archive of Portlandia, uh, there's one episode called Colin the Chicken, C-O-L-I-N, the chicken. And these are two people in the episode going to a restaurant and they're asking the waitress something about where the chicken on the menu comes from. And so the waitress goes into a long, long discourse um, relating everything you might wanna know about this chicken, including its name, Colin. And um, it's, it's pretty hilarious. It's sort of taking this whole question of where our food comes to, from to an absurd level, but it's worth it just to keep your sense of humor about this. Um, not to say that our food, uh, isn't complicated to it, you know, our food system isn't complicated. But um, I think it's just the sheer sort of overwhelming uh, complications of it have kind of put people off in the past. It seems, um, you know, it's, it feels industrial to people. It takes the romance out of our meals. Uh, but it's really critical in terms of how we might build our food system in the in the future. So Here's how that lobster roll probably came together. So you're familiar with, you guys particularly are familiar with the tale of you know, basically how lobster fishing happens, how they're caught, who catches them. But then where the lobster goes from af after that gets a little bit more, uh, that system gets a little more complex. Uh, the lobster may travel from the boat to the pound, for example, and then to a processor, which might be in Canada. And then from, uh, from Canada, it might go return to Maine. It might go to a, a distributor, uh, might go to a, co a cold storage facility, might go to an airport. Uh, and then it might, be, it might go to some, uh, a food service facility that combines that lobster meat yet into a meal or stuffs the tail. Uh, and then it then gets both again, returned to cold storage and maybe shipped someplace else. As you can see, this story, this the, the store that gets it or the consumer that gets it has had um, it has a lot of people handling that lobster since it came off the boat. Um, I see Maine lobsters when I go to the grocery store here in Austin, Texas, and there's a big, you know, glass, uh, aquarium type structure in the middle of the meat market. And there are main lobsters uh, floating around in there alive. Um, I can't imagine how they got there. So this kind of story is really true for almost everything that we eat. So let's look at what the food system is. This is a super um, simplified diagram of a path. Basically, it goes from agriculture or could be aquaculture, basically the production of, of food 
to something people in the systems business call industry, and then to us, the consumers. As you can see, this is a very sort of telescoped summary of a lot of things. Industry, in this case, includes uh, everything from uh, railroads, um, distribution, warehouses. It's, it's all of the movement of food once it leaves a farm and before it arrives um, on our plate. So here's a much more um, uh, complex view. So uh, before your eyes glaze over, let me walk you through this a little bit. So first of all, we're focusing, as you can see by that gray image in the background, we're only focusing on a region. We're not even looking at the global food supply system. This is just North America, Canada, Mexico, Central America, and the tip of South America. So we're just looking at what might occur in that region. And then you can see that we're looking at producers. There's sort of, you can see it follow the arrows around. This is an expanded view of what we just saw in the earlier slide. Producers, um, and then we have uh, plants and animals coming out of that to processors, um, ingredients and actual composed foods come out of that to distributors, then down to more processors, and then, then on to consumers. So there's a few more steps added in there. Like you can see the imports and exports and warehouses and transportation and the distributors. That's blowing it up a little bit more. Then outside of the Great Ring, you see these um, ethics, society, politics, environment, and economics, basically. Um, and these are what economists call externalities. These are things basically outside of the food system, but, basic, but they do um, influence what the behavior of a food system. So for example, if we look at ethics, uh, that might include how food arrives on your plate um, as a re um, relative to how land is treated or how animals are handled. You're probably aware of the term regenerative agriculture, and that's a food system subcategory that signifies how your ingredient was grown. So uh, increasingly, the food system is being influenced and designed by this category or ex externalities of ethics. Um, and the same follows for, say, society. How food arrives on our plate is influenced by cultural practices and beliefs. A food system uh, is shaped by the need for meat to be processed according to, say, Islamic or Hebrew law. So that influences the food system. So you can see about all these different influences, even outside of the actual food system. Um, and they're designed, so the food system is really designed um, according to all of these constraints and influences. Uh, there's no one single solution. It's, it's a system of trade-offs, really. What are you really to, wanting to give up in order to get something? If you want uh, food all grown using regenerative agriculture, there's a set of trade-offs that you need to sort through to decide uh, what you'll give up in order to get that. It might be price, it might be access. It, it, it's a very interesting uh, system of trade-offs. So uh, moving on to yet another view of a, um, of a food system, you can take just one item now. Um, uh, and that would be, in this case, instead of a lobster roll, we're looking at a hamburger. And that might seem like it could be simple, but uh, of course it's complicated because it, a hamburger, in order for it to be called a hamburger, basically has to have certain ingredients. So for example, um, it really relies on a combination of ingredients. Several systems all have to work correctly in order for this to happen, meaning that that you're looking at the supply chain for onions, produce, lettuce, tomatoes. You're also looking for a system for prepared condiments like mustard and ketchup. Seasonings um, uh, and assist even have their own system for processing and distributing. 
So each of those sort of subsystems that are designed for that particular item have to all come together in this logical organization to be able to have someone have a hamburger. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty miraculous if you think about it. Um, and even though we've seen a lot of you know, failure recently, it's been operating pretty well uh, until recent disruptions, which we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. So we you know, be, before these recent disruptions, we've been uh, dealing with things like food con, um, food safety or food contamination where recalls have to happen. Also, natural disasters where uh, whole systems have been disrupted. Um, but uh, those really hadn't happened in as uh, sort of extreme frequency as they do today. Um, all of that's been speeding up. So uh, it's been pretty reliable up to this point. We're not going to discuss some of the uh, sort of uh, more common issues today, like food deserts. Some people might view that as a failure of our food system as well. So let's look at what's just happened, because I've been talking about like we've had a real change. So this is no surprise to any of you, but we've uh, had a pandemic disruption of the food system, climate change, um, conflicts and war, uh, all of these happening in um, more rapidly than in the past, uh, which has not given uh, the food system much time to adapt. So these are a large unpredicted changes in uh, in, in consumer behavior, uh, demand, labor supply, uh, the infrastructure, and actually the location of consumers. You know, there's consumers are much more mobile. So because of this speed of change, and it, it's really caused a shock to the system overall. And people who, in the business of supply chain logistics and, and basically the whole food system are really recalibrating how they're making food, distributing it, and getting it to our tables. So um, in the past, you know, my thing is sort of like, there's some good news out of this dis disruption, which is the general public is much more aware of uh, logistics, supply chains, what causes disruptions, uh, there's a conversation now people actually have because it's really affected them personally. They've gone to stores and shelves are empty, for example, or they they can't buy an item. Now, this is true for most all supply chains, but with the food, it's particularly critical because food basically is perishable. And um, if it's not handled uh, well, then food waste uh, accumulates, and we're trying to solve for food waste at the same time. So the food supply system is is uh, very fragile in that sense, and needs uh, was particularly unique solutions having to do with that perishability. So the food system in the past was really designed for centralized distribution. Uh, it, it came out of the in, uh, sort of the industrialization of the food system where you wanted to concentrate everything in order to bring down the cost. And uh, at that point in time, it, it was benefiting from large centralized computers who could uh, basically design the best path to your plate. But it turns out that this, this uh, mass production and, and concentrated resources is, is causing complications when it comes to its disruptions like the ones that we've been seeing today. Uh, you know, that who you hear from people saying you can't put all your eggs in the same basket, you can't put all your food in the same place, that distributing both computing power and our food system seems to be the path that uh, we need to follow going forward. The art of logistics, which really is the one that, 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 that art designs that system that moves food, um, is usually falls under an area called operations management, uh, where you're really leveraging these big computers and maximizing scale. But as we've saying, the change in consumer demand and climate and these other externalities that we've 
uh, talked about. All of these have caused the system to break down. So, uh, you know, because it's food, remember, and not TVs or cars, we have these specific challenges. For example, although consumer demand might change rapidly, food production depends on natural cycles. Mostly it takes, you know, a given amount of time for cows to give birth or for, you know, um, chickens, eggs to hatch. You can't, you have to respect the natural cycle. So once change is detected at the consumer end and that gets communicated to the production end, it can't be um, dialed in uh, uh, specifically because of the nature of food production. It takes so much time. Some food also grows in specialized environments. So you can't grow bananas just anywhere. That's another unique constraint to designing this particular food supply system. Also, we have really complicated relationships with food. Consumers behave, we behave irrationally, often making food purchasing decisions according to the weather or how we feel, our sleep patterns, our mood, and our specific, specific culture. So, uh, it's it's a real challenge to get ahead of us and figure out what we want to do. But these three things, the time it takes to produce food, the specialized requirement of food production, and the fact that we really behave irrationally uh, makes where we're going to be going in the future even more challenging. So let's look a little bit um, at what happened during the pandemic. This is now, these are headlines from 2020. So uh, we're in 2022. So it's interesting to read these now and think about where we, you know, what, what we see in this moment. So if you'll remember, the pandemic made hunger even more urgent to address. So hunger had been around, but suddenly it became front and center, which is, has happened to many of the issues that existed before the pandemic and our food system. But now we were ever more um, sort of faced with extreme versions of all of these issues. Um, headlines saying how we, the pandemic changed how and what we eat. Will that stick in 2021? Well, think today we're in 2022. Are any of the habits that you had during the pandemic when it came to food, are you still following those today? Um, I wonder, and I think that most uh, companies right now are wondering, trying trying to guess which which behavior changes are lasting and which one which ones aren't. And um, another headline: Doomsday preppers stock up on luxury survival kits. Uh, we all wanted to be prepared for the next thing, and I also wonder whether or not we're sticking to that mentality. It's interesting how quickly we forget. So what does this, this whole atmosphere of disruption, what does it give us? Well, out of this chaos, which it can seem like, really are some opportunities for change. It, there's opportunities to be creative. And um, there's also uh, solutions that leverage paradoxes. And so what do I mean about that? Well, paradoxes are seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statements that turn out to, to be um, well-founded or true. So while it might seem that bananas can't grow in Iceland, it turns out to be true that bananas have been grown in greenhouses in Iceland. So this, this sort of atmosphere of disruption is causing people to return to things that they had dismissed in the past as being impossible and revisiting them as possibilities. A lot of blurring of boundaries, a lot of reconsidering of where uh, food ought to be grown, for example. You know, or if natural ingredients are arguably more healthy for human consumption, it might also turn out that lab-made food might be also healthy. So interesting sort of paradoxes of uh, groups of people who didn't ordinarily talk to each other are now talking to each other. Uh, use of chemistry to create non-animal proteins, for example. 
So there is a burst of creativity, which I think is encouraging. So in moving forward, uh, one thing I discovered by, in writing this book was that there really were some common ingredients to uh, food supply chains into food systems that operate well. And they were reliability, trust, adaptability, and technology. So what do I mean by those things? So when I say reliability, I mean that uh, a food system has to be predictable in some way, meaning that because one part of the food system relies on uh, another, that you really have to have some predictability built into it. For example, um, a, a truck delivery schedule arriving on a loading dock has to be somewhat reliable because there are other trucks coming and arriving. And if that food truck driver doesn't arrive at his uh, point at time, then all of the other trucks that are about to arrive get bumped or you know out of schedule. And the one that failed to, realize, to arrive on time might have to wait its turn by keeping its motor running in the back alley, waiting for a turn to get to the loading dock. That's just you know one example about why the system has to have some reliability built into it. And ever since the food system was you know, invented, uh, when the first traders were we're trading olive oil and, and uh, goods across the Mediterranean. Trust was essential. Uh, you need, when, when transactions occur throughout the food system, uh, one seller and one buyer have to establish trust, meaning uh, trust that the prices um, are reasonable, might be consistent, they will get paid, what's in the box is actually what they agreed to have in the box. Um, and uh, so trust is essential. And although there's been a lot of work recently done in making food systems um, transparent, so you can see the interactions, there's still some hesitancy um, because uh, people don't want to, you know, so suppliers don't, don't want to reveal who they work with or what their prices are or where their ultimate sources of food are. Sometimes that's their competitive advantage. So, uh, but still trust is essential as is adaptability, as uh, weather changes, consumers move around, food system has to be able to be adaptable, also known as resilient. And technology is critical because this is where uh, the creative solutions for moving forward come from to reduce the time that food is in transit, for example, or um, that um, storage systems can avoid um, creating food waste by uh, failing to keep things cool, for example. So these are really the four essential ingredients. So we're learning a lot more. The general public is learning a lot more about how the food system operates. Um, but uh, but now, what do we do with this additional knowledge, for example? So the current project I'm working on at the Institute um, for Nutrition, the Nutrition Institute at UT, is a place where we're exploring what to do with this new information. Uh, we're encouraging new ideas, and we're really trying to break down the silos, which, as you can imagine, exist in academia. Um, and try to engender curiosity to address the need really for a faster, more personalized, adaptable and resilient global food system, trying to address the misalignment of uh, these knowledge silos. So at Texas, where I am currently at the Nutrition Institute, we're focusing on these issues. The fact that research is disconnected from people and places. So there's research being done, but it's not having any impact because it's not getting it to the people that need it um, to inform how, how they can both eat but also acquire food. Number two is the inability to communicate science to the public, uh, especially nutrition has been um, questioned a lot because the, 
the flip-flopping back and forth and some of its recommendations. Uh, so people uh, really aren't able to understand the science behind uh, nutrition. Also, just the general lack of empathy and understanding of multiple externalities and systems approach. So that system that I showed you that had all of those uh, things that, like culture and economics and uh, that to really um, create some empath you know, empathic understanding of what everyone is dealing with really enables more intelligent trade-offs to be made. And that's what we're really working on at UT. So this institute has been around for 10 years, but it really hasn't um, grown or had uh, uh, as much of an impact as the original founders thought it might have. Um, we're adding, so we're really reimagining, we might even change the name of it. We're adding design and systems thinking to it. We're building an international perspective, mostly around Latin America, because almost half of uh, Texas right now includes uh, Latin Americans. And we're rethinking courses so that from basically having uh, static webinars to opportunities for learning experiences, getting into the field, learning what people need and want, trying again, just to break down that, that barrier between academics, students, learning, and the real world. And we're using co-creation to do that, meaning we're not going to go off in, into a closet and figure out what this institute should do, but we're allowing most of the people who um, are excited about this potential to inform what the institute will be in the future. So uh, if uh, you know where we're going, not only at the institute, but also uh, with, um, in the, at, with food systems design in general, we're moving from these centralized systems to distributed ones. We're moving from the idea that it has to be big to be effective, but we're now moving to a, how do we use data and computing to be more effective as opposed to just scaling everything. We're, we're redefining distance from global to local. A lot more producers are thinking about moving points of production closer to consumers. Um, we're addressing uh, where we're going is really to have more mobile consumers. It seems like people are moving around uh, more rapidly than in the past. So the food system needs to address that. And also the, we're going for to react or respond to this demand for a more reliable uh, food si system and one that is safe, um, free from contamination. So Summarizing, adapting to rapid change is really going to be critical. Managing this sort of predictable irrationality, this is where um, behavioral econ economists come into play. It, I don't think you'll change our being irrational, but we might be able to anticipate it more. The system will possess resilience, agility, be able to change quickly. It will be much more transparent People want to know uh, the track that their food came from. It will offer redundancy, backup systems. So if there's a failure in one part of the system, it won't bring the whole system down. And it will allow align with those um, externalities we were talking about, social and environmental. So I've covered a lot. I understand that a lot to digest, uh, but I do welcome questions and and um, uh, an opportunity to ask more about uh, what's going on. So thank you. Thank you for your attention. And, and uh, I'm open to answering any questions. Thank you very much, Robin. Maybe we can have the lights on. I do have a little question to start, Robin, and that is that I understand, I understand that much of our seafood that we eat here may be harvested from the North Atlantic, but is sent to China for processing and then back to our grocery stores. And I wondered if you'd comment on that, the pros and cons of that. <laughs> <I know. Yeah. laughs> That's where it seems really illogical, right? And this, and this happens all over the food system. Um, and a lot of that comes out of uh, specialization. So um, there's actually a fish uh, market 
um, a, a fish business, I should say, down off the fish pier in Boston called, um, I think it's Red's Best, something like that. Red's, maybe it's just called Red's. But anyway, what they do is they actually um, encourage local fishermen to stay in business by buying most all of their catch, which means they uh, buy their buy, buy catch, with, which was normally called in the past trash fish, but they basically buy the whole harvest from a fisherman. And they're very interested in changing this paradigm of sending uh, fish in particular over long distances. Uh, and he's tried some experiments. Uh, this happens a lot, by the way, uh, with sending shellfish to the far east to for processing and back again. And that, so he tried it, but he he ran into the fact that the labor really is specialized in some of these cases. Like most all of the high-end sushi meat goes to the Tokyo market, where that system is got buyers and sellers, long trusted relationships. Some of this is changing, but it's much, much harder to change these um, subsystems that rely on these long um, histories of developing both the skills and the labor uh, and to try to figure out how we can make all this food as affordable by bringing home labor where the, you know, the pay is much higher. So uh, it's a great question. It happens a lot in, in a lot of our um, ingredients. Uh, one solution in Maine is, you know, eels. There's an eel business. And usually eels, you know, get grown up. They, you know, have this big cycle of development. They go come from the Sargasso Sea. They're raised to be juveniles. And then they're sent over to Asia to be grown out. And then they're sent back to us. Again, sort of like, this is strange, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but there is uh, a couple of new ventures in Maine where uh, they're attempting to do the grow out here in Maine and avoid that whole cycle. Thank so you. let me see if anyone else has a question. Any other questions here from the, yes. Um, you mentioned that one of the questions that seems to be coming up you know, lately is where your food comes from. And I'd like to know, which farms my produce is coming from because I don't want it to be contaminated by PFAS. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with the PFAS crisis, your name, Robin? No, I'm, I can't quite hear what you said there. What crisis? Where her produce comes from here in Maine because she doesn't want to be buying from farms that are contaminated with the PFAS chemicals, the forever chemicals that have been. Oh, right, 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 right. Well, the, yeah, and and I think there's, is the question, how can she find out more about where it's grown? Yes, yes, yes she said yes. Yes, good, okay. <laughs> um, there, I mean, I can't answer for a specific grower or anything like that or a specific state, but there is a lot because consumers just like you want to, to have that information. So um, the market seems to be responding to that. And more and more, there are ways to, you know, basically scan a QR code on your package and know exactly where your food comes from. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, will take some time to get those costs down for really small producers. Uh, but for the large producers, you can, I mean, you can buy your Thanksgiving turkey now and scan it and know exactly what farm it comes from. Uh, there's fish where you can scan uh, a barcode and know exactly not only where it comes from, but what boat it's grown, uh, it was harvested uh, from and who the fisherman was. So I think there's, there's a lot going on in tracking and traceability, and some of it will be more common when the costs come down. Did that answer your question? Yes. Um, so I, I have tried actually asking the market itself where some of the produce came from, but they're being very close now about it. Yeah. They probably, in some cases, don't know, depending upon who you, <laughs> who you ask. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. they put labels, really generic labels, like this comes from Chile. But if you want to know the exact farm that it comes from on Chile, you'll need, that's where these, these scanning 
you know, they put these trackers actually in the boxes of food where they can actually track the movement and the time, which they want to do to minimize perishability so that you can see exactly how much time something sits on a loading dock. Thank you. Yes, in the back. You may have to speak up pretty loudly. <laughs> Could you talk a bit about consumer expectations and how they've changed over the years? And um, I mean, I, I'm as we were talking about all the variety, it struck me that when I was a kid and you went to the supermarket, the choice was iceberg lettuce or maybe um, Boston lettuce. And now, you know, there's 47 different varieties of greens in various combinations. So can you talk a little bit about how our expectations as consumers have changed for what we can have access to and how has that affected the systems? Gosh, how long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> that's a big, that's a big question. And, and I think we all know there's a lot more choices, right? Uh, some of that is our, of our own making, because as we have developed um, a lot more allergies, we require a lot more specialized food, you know, so we've been pushing for these things, um, gluten-free, et cetera. So um, I think there's a health move uh, um, for us pushing that as well. And just because we're so much more literate about food, uh, that I think uh, an awareness that there are choices out there. Um, has really pushed consumers to um, explore new options, try new things. Um, I'm not sure whether your question is about, is it a good thing or a bad thing? But our expectations are certainly much higher than they've been in the past, and the food system has been able to deliver them. So the bar is higher. And uh, I don't know. There are some people who are really pushing to, to um, lessen those choices. And um, again, those are just trade-offs, I think. Another um, question in the back? Yeah, um, I wonder if uh, you feel that um, market forces are sensitive to adapting for global warming. I'm sure moving things closer is one, one strategy, but if you could maybe mention anything else that they might be doing that makes us feel like they care for the planet too. <laughs> One, the one situation I'm aware of is uh, coffee growers, in, uh, which require certain um, cooler temperatures, and they are, are moving their farms um, higher, higher elevations to get, um, you know, to, to adapt in that way. Um, but perhaps your question is more about using, should we say, water resources more mindfully? Um, and and that's happening, uh, but it you know it takes a lot of time. I think there's a much greater awareness of of climate change right now, and I know whenever I go to a conference or wherever I'm sitting in a room of people concerned about this, everyone's scrambling to figure out what to do, and and again, it takes a long time because you know food relies on um, natural cycles to figure out. Anyone else? All right, well, it's it's almost 12.50, Robin, and I know she has to go on to chair a uh, panel discussion, I think, at the university. So let's uh, give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all for, for your good questions and for your attention. This is a, a big, gnarly, messy topic, and uh, I wish it were easier to explain, but... Um, Use your curiosity. Ask all those questions of everybody you're buying food from. That'll push them to make Look forward things. to hearing more from the Nutrition Institute, too. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Okay.